I have one that I don't really like to tell, because everyone expects evidence, as if that's something you consider at the time. It's also set in a city, specifically Newark, New Jersey. And I think people think that stuff like this is exclusively in rural areas because they feel safe thinking cops and other people are around. Truth is, cops don't care. People don't care. That, or they'll dismiss it as fake. And I'm sure with the flat earth threads here, you can understand just how far people's deniability can go. But it's a green text thread, so I'm not too worried about believability. Be two years ago, live in a shitty apartment in a shitty part of Newark. I know that doesn't really pin things down, given it's Newark. But there were always cops posted outside, and it wasn't uncommon for shootouts and dead bodies to occur on the street below. Lived there with sister and her girlfriend, who we'll call E and A. A sold weed, was constantly high, and had no problem walking around the house topless. She had ADHD and wasn't the smartest person, buying into that Illuminati bullshit. She was really caring though, and actually, an amazingly clever business person. Being a black stoner with dreads from a poor family probably didn't help in getting her too far up on the entrepreneur ladder though. E is an amazing singer and okay painter. She believes in all that energy crystal bullshit, though along with uh, witchcraft and tarot cards. I love her, but she's actually kind of a psychopath. Mostly nice and carefree to others until she has no use for them. Then she'll brutally toss them aside if they get in her way. Me, I was recently medically discharged from the military. At that point, due to back issues and PTSD. Don't worry, this isn't one of those and then I pulled out my katana stories. Just establishing the setting. And it likely explains why it took us so long to realize what was going on. We're all some type of crazy, so it just seemed par for the course. Anyway, the apartment building. It was this horrid old thing that was tan on the outside and had nine floors. The inside was this ugly yellow green with wood painted over with the ugliest brown possible. The elevator was one of those old gate door things which you needed to slam open, though it wasn't an issue since it barely ever worked anyway. We lived on the seventh floor. You can imagine how fun that was on summer days. The landlord was some sort of Hispanic who also owned the corner store across the street. At the time, A was obsessed with Broad City and would loudly stream it on Hulu to drown out the sound of our crackhead neighbors and ghetto people unfamiliar with the concept of having an indoor voice. A would often go on the fire escape to smoke a joint. And the first weird thing to happen was she got locked out there for about three hours. The window was heavy as shit and hard to bring down and lock, so it was fairly impossible for it to happen accidentally. It was just me there and I was locked in my room reading so I didn't hear her yell. And boy was she pissed after thinking it was me pulling a prank. That kind of went out the window though when she got back in and noticed the laptop she had been streaming on had basically every image file she had open. I'm neurotic as shit and won't touch other people's things just in case something went missing. But as she closed the images, she saw her laptop camera had been taking pictures. Nothing too mysterious, just a bookshelf it was pointed at. Her reaction was mostly along the lines of, Whoa, spoopy, but not too worried. This was one of the days the elevator was working, but as shitty as it was, it got stuck halfway through the fourth floor. She presses the emergency button and sees a pair of legs passing by, which she calls to press the elevator button to see if it would go up. Anyway, Red Shoes doesn't respond, and when she tried to get closer to see who it was, they instinctively back away. Whatever, crackheads. She wasn't there for long before someone pressed a button at least. But about three-ish days later, we found out that this wasn't an isolated incident. Someone new had been moving in on the next floor and apparently got locked into their apartment when they were trying to head back down to get more boxes. The door wasn't locked and the knob turned, but it refused to give. 
We found this out after he complained about the landlord's reaction, which was basically nervously smiling and nodding as if he didn't understand. Those were the calm days. E had this rule to not respond to knocks on the door unless she expected them, believing it was either someone asking for money, trying to get us to go to their church, or trying to rob us. This was reasonable since the first two would be a thing during the day. I should mention at this point, I had decided to sleep on the living room couch. I'd been sleeping on just a mattress at one point, but after waking up to a rat crawling out from the heater right next to me, I noped the fuck out of there. It was about three in the morning when I woke up to knocking at a weird pace. I figured it was a crackhead and ignored it. It kept on going. At that point, I got mad. I grabbed the knife from the kitchen and looked through the keyhole to see no one there. I opened the door anyway, only to find two other neighbors looking out their apartment, both claiming it was their door that had been knocked on. The next day, one of the neighbors, this Caribbean dude who I'm pretty sure was an attorney from how he dressed, asked me and the other neighbor to back him up in talking to the landlord so we could see the cameras on the elevator and stairs and see if we could find out who it was. Landlord admits that the cameras don't actually work, and B was not having it. Who the fuck is B? He filed a police report and threatened to sue if they didn't replace the cameras, and kept bugging the landlord for a few days. Then, suddenly, he stopped. We got curious when we found the cops and ambulance leaving our floor, and A, being our spokesperson, was the one who asked B's girl. Apparently, since that night... He hadn't been sleeping much, and though we thought he was just pissed about the cameras, she said he'd just been getting overall angry and crazy over time. This led to her waking up to finding him at the door in nothing but boxers, having pissed himself and being completely unresponsive. They took him to the hospital, but not before she had to drag his body out of the door's way. This wasn't unusual, by the way, crackheads and whatnot, so... People figured he OD'd, but he seemed pretty up and up. I'll admit we probably should have followed up, but we didn't. So, it was E who kind of mentioned the next part. B's girl had sort of just started acting way too happy, responding to E's chit-chat with an unbreaking smile and vague responses. A few days later, the other neighbor that had opened the door with me had called the cops on her. Apparently, she'd been knocking on his door at 3 a.m. In nothing but a shirt and underwear, still not breaking her smile. This neighbor had a family, so a mournful booty call was unlikely. He mentioned, though, that he did try to open the door at one point, but it wouldn't open, and the cops had to come up the stairs because the elevator wouldn't open. So she literally just stood there, smiling, until they came and freaked the fuck out, kicking and screaming when they took her away. I was actually more surprised that they hadn't shot her. Anyway, that neighbor started getting ready to move out soon after as well. But apparently Crazy Lady hadn't been the last straw. Soon after, the neighbor's daughter, who was like 12, started acting weird herself. The parents didn't want to go into detail, but their 10-year-old son had no such qualms. She had been dragging herself against the wall and floors, kind of like a cat with a really bad itch, which is his description. And when asked why, she just responded by denying it, despite very much still doing it, as she did much to the frustration. They eventually found her pressing her parts against the corner of the wall without any pants on. And shortly after whooping the crap out of her, decided... It was this place driving her crazy. Oh boy, it's our turn. That was A's joke, having noticed the pattern. We were the ones left that had opened the door that night, and I couldn't really say much having been the one that opened the door. E, of course, responded by trying to do cleansing spells and all that new age magic stuff to try to ward things off. But that didn't work out too well for us. A, being the hyper-energetic puppy that she is, had been up late smoking a joint on the fire escape. Now directly on the windowsill to prevent any lockouts. She freaked out and started panicking, however, after seeing E 
standing outside in the middle of the street. Naturally, she freaked out, thinking E was in bed, asleep, and yelled out her name, trying to get her attention. I woke up to her rushing into the room to put a shirt on, ready to run downstairs after her, only to be met with a pissed-off E, now sitting up awake in bed. E complained that she was high, but all three of us are very much aware of that's not how weed works. The next night, I woke up to A shaking me awake, freaking out. She claimed that E was gone, which made no sense, since she would have to have passed by me to get out of the apartment. We both simultaneously looked out the window with the fire escape, but luckily didn't see any E pancake down the street. A decides she's going to go down anyway, but when she tries to open the front door, it doesn't budge. She has me try, but I can't manage it either. Looking through the keyhole to see if anything was in the way, but it was just black, as if something was blocking it. That's when I notice out in the hall, it sounds like there's a bunch of people running, like stampede level amounts of footsteps, and we start to freak out. A is starting to cry when we suddenly hear screaming coming from my room. Now my room isn't big, it's basically a square with a surprisingly deep closet that E kept stuff stored in. It did apparently benefit in having great acoustics though, because the scream was loud as fuck, like painfully loud. We burst in to see the closet door trying to shake open, and A opens it with me right behind. The weird thing is, the scream kept going up until the closet door was fully open. But when we opened it, there E was, with the widest, creepiest fucking grin I had ever seen her make. A sort of burst back and grabbed onto me, because when we opened the door, she was right there, like almost nose to nose with her, unflinching. Moments later, she responded as if she'd just woken up, confused as shit to where she was. A tried to go back to bed with her, but was still freaking out, and, frankly, scared of her. So me and her just stayed up the rest of the night. The next day, we decided to move out, staying at A's aunt for a while till we found a new place and only going in to get our stuff during the day. E, being the asshole that she is, later recommended the building to a friend, who lasted there for about a month before moving out, because they became violently ill, and telling us about a pair of neighbors that were found dead in our old apartment. I'm not entirely sure if that wasn't just crack, though. Anyway, fuck that place, and fuck Newark. I'm not gonna lie, we were both kind of assholes to E for a bit, avoiding eye contact and being alone with her. But we were pretty fucking terrified. It was literally just her smiling. I've known her for 22 years and never seen her to be able to smile that widely. It was almost like her mouth had stretched out. She's the one that suggested later that maybe it was something roaming the hallway, which explains why we couldn't get to whatever shit was going on but that didn't explain her being in the street. We didn't really get a lot of answers, and we weren't really trying to. There weren't really any after effects once we left, though. So at least, she's good now. <laughs>